Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining episode 32 of The Green Light. So today's episode is a continuation or part two of last week's episode on dietary guidelines with amazing Dr. Henry Ely or Dr. H. Dr. H is the founder and community director of the Energetic Health Institute and if you want to check him out, we have a couple of episodes with him that are really, really good about water, about the future of healthcare, I means so much. He shares so much goodness and he's going to be really one of my frequent guests because he has so much to teach. So today we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the conversation that we had last week about what makes a healthy diet. So we're going to talk about alkalinity and if you are listening on Apple or Spotify, so if you're just listening to the audio, you can go on YouTube and actually see the presentation Dr. Ely is also sharing so that you have some visual as well. So without further ado, let's get started with this amazing episode. Welcome Dr. H. Hi Dr. Ely, thank you for being back for part two of our episode. How are you today? <laughs> oh, thank you for having me back. I'm feeling great. i um, really excited to talk about health and nutrition with you. Um, how are you doing today? I'm great. I'm doing awesome. And I'm very excited about this conversation and where we left the last week. So just to recap, we went through the Sweet 16, which is Mm -hmm. part of your book, an amazing book. And uh, that really helps us understand what is necessary to nourish ourselves. And I like that it's very holistic as an approach. It's not just about the food, but a lot lot of, of course, uh, guidelines on food or the choices that we make. And um, as we mentioned last week, we're just trying to really understand how dietary guidelines from our governments don't necessarily meet all our needs um, nutritionally. Mm -hmm. They just Mm -hmm. really focus on calories and those calories are not necessarily equal for everybody. And so you really broke it down perfectly. And I think if today we dive into um, the alkalinity and acidity of food to make people understand what the food does into our body, that's going to really be a powerful tool for people to understand what they should be looking at when they choose their food. Sure. You know, it's it's exciting to talk about it because there are a lot of misconceptions, I think, about this. And one of the things that I, I really like to um, share with uh, with folks is, you know, we, we tend to have this misguided belief that if it's natural, you know, um, that it's all everything in the natural world is good or all the information is accurate. And that's not true. There's a lot of really nonsense in the in the natural world. Um, just like there's a lot of nonsense on that synthetic, you know, allopathic side of things as well. So what we're always in pursuit of is the truth, you know, and I think the way that we confirm whether or not something is true is does the body play that out? Does the body prove that what we're saying actually works? And if we have that as the standard of proof, then what it allows us to do is cut through a nonsense that has either agendas and finance and you know, money kind of goals or the stuff that just sounds good, but doesn't really work. You know what I mean? Because those Mm. are the things that really injure people's trust in what's being said. Yeah, absolutely. And I think actually you mentioned right now in if how do our bod- how do our bodies respond? And I think that's really important. So if you yeah. actually can talk also about uh, delayed allergies, that would be really good because a lot of people don't think about their sensitivities or if there is something that perhaps doesn't work for them, even though this food can be amazing and really healthy. So yeah, we, we can start. Um, well, let's start from the concept of food into our bodies and mm-hmm. what is alkaline and what is acidic. Okay. Well, you know, I think the the first thing that I want to do, let me let me bring up a couple of pictures here if I can. Um, I'm going to bring up a picture here. Uh, where are my cell images? I'm going to bring up a picture on just what we think we understand about pH, uh, mm-hmm. about pH scale and things like that. Let me just make sure I get the, not the PNG, I want the JPEG so everybody can see it. Okay. So let's, uh, I'm going to pull this up and share with everybody. I think it's easier to see a couple of images if that's okay. Yeah, perfect. In fact, folks, if you're listening on uh, Spotify or Apple, if you go to YouTube, you'll have access to the slides. Awesome. So, you know, when we, when we talk about pH, we always talk about it in an absolute model. And that Mm -hmm. absolute model is zero to 14, or in this case, one to 14, where seven is considered neutral. And the further you get towards uh, one, the more acidic something is, the more you get towards 14, the more alkaline or basic something is. Mm. And so what they've done in this 
you know, loose idea of a pH scale here is they're showing things like stomach acid is about a, a one. It's usually 1.2 to 2.2 on, or should be um, for the pH scale, meaning it's very acidic because what does acid do? It breaks things down. So we need acid. We need acid to break things down. We need acid in the immune cells because immune cells have their own little stomach called lysosomes that break things down. So when an immune cell eats something, you want to be able to break it down. You need really something really strong. So what's a side note to this is how the body maintains its um, acidity where acidity is needed is typically through proton pumps. So there's little proton pumps that make things very acidic and keep like the stomach acidic when we're eating food. That's why proton pump inhibitors are so disastrous because it turns off not only the stomach acid, which we need to break the food down, but it turns off things that happen within the cell that depend on proton pumps, most notably immune cells that depend on proton pumps and also mitochondria within the cells that produce energy. It turns them off too. Mm -hmm. So one of my first things, Chantel, just on a side note that I get out of my patients, um, medical diet, if you will, mm -hmm. are proton pump inhibitors. I get them off them immediately because they're just destroying people. Yeah. In my professional opinion. <laughs> I yeah, call, no, qualify. I agree with I agree with you actually. And I also noticed one thing when I talk to clients who have heartburn and they mm -hmm. really can't deal, it's mostly their diet. It's their diet that is causing it. And um if we adjust the diet suddenly they don't actually need those medications anymore. Exactly. Uh, indigestion above age 25 is typically ind indicative clinically of delayed food allergens that people are unaware of. And we'll talk about that in a second too, mm. um, because that exacerbates it and then things hurt. So what do you look for? You look for a solution. And then you have these people over here telling you this is a solution. It's not a solution. It's a bandaid. Mm. And it's a bad bandaid at that because it creates a lot of other problems, a lot of other side effects in the body that are disastrous over a period of time. Mm. All right. So that's really the first thing. But when you look at this pH scale, you also get things like uh, lemon juice is at about a two, you know, they'll say apple juice is about a three. I've tested it. No, it's not. It's really about a five. <laughs> um, but, you know, what this is all saying is these things are slightly acidic, mm. right? And there's, and water would be neutral at seven. And then you start moving like into baking soda or potassium bicarbonates and stuff. And those start being alkaline and, uh, or, or what would be called basic. But again, when you're in a one to 14 pH model, what you're essentially saying is that I'm looking at this through absolute terms. Mm. And that doesn't really fly when you are looking at pH or talking about pH with respect to our health. Mm. pH in terms of our health is a relative scale. All right, so what happens outside of the body yeah, like for lemon juice, for example, is very acidic. But what's interesting is what happens when it comes into the body. It actually becomes very alkaline. Why? Because that lemon juice comes with, if it's organic, of course, I'm going to preface everything that what I say is that it's organic, no pesticides on it. That the lemon juice, when it comes into the body, becomes alkaline. How do I know? Because we've actually tested urine pH and a person will, you can do this test at home for yourself using organic lemon juice, no sugar. You know, we don't want any sugar or anything like that in there. Cause that's going to be very acidic, but just a little bit of lemon juice. What you do is you can check your urine before you, um, before you take the lemon juice and then take a little pee and then, you know, check your with a pH strip. And then you check your pH typically about um, an hour afterwards when you urinate again. And what you're asking yourself is we're in a relative model now is what I just did. In this case, we're talking about just lemon juice. What I just did, did that increase my, my urine pH or did it decrease? If it increases your urine pH, that means you, what you ever you did was alkalizing to your body. If it decreases your pH, then that means whatever you did was acidic to your body. Now, we do want the urine pH to be much higher than the allopathic world suggests it should be. The urine pH, I've talked with an expert on this, Dr. Robert Young, who's all about alkalinity, he wrote the pH miracle. This is his, this is his wheelhouse. He feels that urine pH should be closer to neutral, closer to seven, if not even a little bit over if a person's in a cancerous state and they're trying to get them into a healing state, right? Mm-hmm. 
Um, so I defer to his judgment on that. I think that when they say urine should be between like a pH of five and absolute pH of five and six, I think that's too low. I think that's a sign that what you're doing with your lifestyle, what you're doing with your diet is has a net effect pH. And this is where we're talking about relative. <laughs> a, net, a net effect pH on the body. <laughs> that's all right. I was like, whoa, that was, that, that woke me up. There's my coffee right there. <laughs> I think it, it when we when we're talking about absolute pH, we're talking about zero to fourteen on a pH scale. What happens outside the body? When we're talking about a relative pH. We're talking about what does the food or and or lifestyle do to the overall body? And the way we measure that is really through urine pH. If we start in the morning, let's say Chantel, we we wake up in the morning when your urine's supposed to be the most acidic, and we urinate and we check our urine, and let's say it comes out at five point five right? In, in an absolute model. And then we have some, you know, we went through and did our intermittent fasting. And then when we broke our fast, we had some, some foods that are supposedly have a net effect, alkalizing effect upon the body. When we urinate later, what we should see is that the urine pH started at 5.5 in the absolute model in the morning. But when we check our urine pH again, it's now gone up to like 6.5. Mm. That tells us that we've become more alkaline. And that only way that can occur is because what we've done with our day, our diet and our lifestyle has been alkalizing. Okay. And that's why we say at Energetic Health Institute, we teach net effect, right? Because it's not about what the pH is outside the body. Like in the case of lemons, lemons are acidic outside of the body, but when we put them into our body, they, be, they have a net effect, alkalizing effect upon the body. So when we, when we look at this, it's very, very important to understand what you're talking about. And this is where a lot of people in the holistic world get confused. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are thinking in terms of the absolute zero to 14 pH scale, when they should be thinking about a relativistic model for pH and just simply did it, did my urine get more alkaline or less alkaline with what I did during the day, more alkaline or more acidic? Cause that's telling you everything you need to know. So what is the biggest influence for net effect pH? The biggest influence for net effect pH is what we eat. Mm. It's why we are such a huge um, proponent of organic plant-based foods. One of the things that I tell folks is to eat something green every day. Green is, has, is rich in chlorophyll, and being rich in chlorophyll, it helps to support the formation of new red blood cells. And with new red blood cells, you get oxygen binding capacity improved in your body. Now, there are some substances that are very alkalizing generally to people. Number one is oxygen, the most alkalizing substance you can take into your body. That's why people who practice pranayama, meditation, some type of breathing practice are typically very chill right? Because they are very, very alkaline. The other next thing that's very alkalizing to the body is chlorophyll, is anything that's green. So if you're breathing every day and making sure you're eating something green every day, you are creating a net effect alkaline environment in your body. And you can, you can measure your pH with this, your urine pH. Now there's also an additional thing you can do. And that additional thing that you can do is you can take in um, potassium bicarbonate. I don't recommend sodium bicarbonate, but I do like recommending potassium bicarbonate. And this is where Dr. Young, and actually, I guess I'll do a plug for him. He, he makes a really good formulation if you can get it. Um, I think it's called eye juice, um, where it's just potassium bicarbonate. It's uh, four basic mineral salts with a little bit of organic lemon juice in it. And when you take it in, and I've tested this on myself, I've tested this on patients, it will raise urine pH by almost uh, like a point and a half. So like I did it one day, Chantel, and my morning urine pH was, I think, uh, uh, 6.0, which was mm -hmm. a little acidic. It's more acidic than I like to be, right? I like mm -hmm. to be about 6.8 or higher somewhere in there if I'm really checking. And I, I, I'm not anal about this, but I do check periodically. So I was doing a little experiment and I was every morning drinking his, uh, and I still do this periodically. I got to get back on. I've actually fallen out of the habit a little bit with some moving I was doing and stuff, but, um, his, uh, his product with the potassium bicarbonate, mm. 
you just put a little bit in water in the morning and you drink it and then you go check your urine a little bit later. I've seen it personally. I've seen it raised by about a point and a half. So I've I've been over seven, you know, with it. And I was like, wow, that's that's really crazy. Guess what else does it though? Juicing. Juicing does this, mm. has this same net effect pH, the same net alkalizing effect for pH. What okay, were you going to ask? We're talking about real juicing, though, not pasteurized bulk juices, Of right? course. No, it's got to be, you just made it. You, it's a, or, like, there's some simple rules to juicing. Number one, if when you're looking at a fruit or vegetable, you wouldn't eat it, don't yeah. juice it. Okay, yeah. that's, that's number one. Number two, make sure it's organic because we've seen plenty in, in clinical practice where people have pesticide residue. It's, even if they go, like Chantel, they'll go to even like some places that make juices for them. So it's still technically fresh. Mm. But if those places aren't using organic produce, there's going to be pesticide residue all over their juicers. And it shows up in the juice and it shows up then in patients' urine when, we te when we've tested it in the past. So when you're juicing, Purity is of the utmost importance, and it's better just to invest in a juicer. I think for yourself, pick out your own produce, grow your own produce or your own organic produce, and then juice it. And you know, and, and then what you're getting into your body is incredible array of antioxidants, vitamins, minerals, and uh, other phytochemicals that are just so essential to maintaining a really strong uh, net effect pH that is is alkaline for your body. Oh, totally. Um, okay, I, before we carry on, I need to ask you to just to clarify about Dr. Young, because I think a lot of people in Europe have seen a documentary by BBC a few years ago, and it, was, um, it wasn't depicted, depicted in a very good light. Uh, yeah. We talked about this before, and I think it needs to be clarified. So Dr. Young was uh, called a charlatan and someone that didn't have um, the PhD he says he has, and... Um, and of, of course, everybody believes what they hear on the media. And I personally never really looked into him up to when we had the mm -hmm. conversation. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, Google doesn't <laughs> give you the best information either because, you know, parts of the media. But um, what did happen there? What, what, mm -hmm. Why did, does this guy have such a bad rep and uh, has been really, you know, classified as a charlatan? And I think, and not only a quack, but a fraudster. Uh, can you just clarify that for people? Hmm. A couple of things. One, I would encourage everyone to watch the Thrive movies, Thrive 1 and Thrive 2. Dr. Young is in in both. I think he's he's very well represented in, in Thrive 2. I forget whether it's Thrive 1 or Thrive 2. It might be Thrive 2 that he was very well represented in. He talks openly about what happens. I know Dr. Young. I've, I've talked with him. I had the pleasure of meeting him at a conference we were at. Um, he was railroaded by the pharmaceutical industry. In, in my opinion, and, and not surprisingly, he was doing something that they didn't want done. This is the same thing that happened to Dr. Max Gerson and forced him to leave the country and go and set up a clinic in Mexico now being run by his daughter, Charlotte. This is the same thing they did with uh, Dr. Berinsky uh, and his uh, um, and his uh, his his treatments for cancer. Cancer industry is a huge moneymaker for the pharmaceutical industry. All right. Uh, so anyone showing that you can cure it without them, they are going to aggressively attack on multiple fronts. They're going to use their influence on state medical boards to go after um, anyone who's showing good work, especially naturally. Um, they are going to use their enormous financial influence in media to create perceptions that people are quote unquote charlatans and snake oil salesmen, when in fact those terms wax was what they were called in the early 1900s when you know your history. Um, when you look at what Dr. Young has done, I've seen some of his work. He has definitive proof of reversing stage four cancer. Um, that doesn't sound like a charlatan to me. He has advised multiple pres presidential administrations. I don't think a president of the United States would uh, seek to have somebody advising them in present in, in their presence that was a charlatan. So um, I think there's a lot of legitimacy and my understanding of uh, how he was attacked, his, his ability to practice was attacked, was very simply that um, there was an IV in a patient's arm. Uh, and because he is not a licensed medical professional, even though he does have a PhD in biochemistry, 
Um, he was not, he, uh, there was an IV in a patient's arm. The uh, patient, uh, the doctor who was attending wasn't uh, available. They had to go and do something. Dr. Young simply pulled the IV when it was done out of the patient's arm. And for that, he had his, he had, uh, he was uh, said he was practicing medicine without a license for doing that. Oh, wow. Uh, (laughs) So, right. So, you know, and it's of course been hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not more of fighting and fighting and fighting, because that's what they do. They want to get you into a legal fight um, and take your license away and discredit you and da, 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 you know, and all that other nonsense so that they can um, wear you down. This is what they've done with all of the organic farmers who don't want GMOs. You know, if you watched Food Inc. and you read the story of, or watched the story of Mopar, um, who was a seed saver and how many times uh, Monsanto has sued him. They, they, They sue because they have unlimited resources to sue just to send a message. And they know they can't win, but it doesn't matter. They've already wiped out hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars of your resources. So their resources are going to far outlast yours. And there's no accountability or justice for them in doing that uh, because uh, they're the ones that basically pay for like the NIH. They pay huge portions of the NIH budget and they tithe, if you will, um, donate to political campaigns on both sides of the fence to make sure that the laws are always in in their favor. So I think in this day and age, if we've learned one thing, Chantel, it's to question everything and especially question what is being said about people in the mainstream media. Because if you really want to know who's who's influencing the public perception, all you have to do is watch the commercials. Whoever (laughs) is putting out commercials, that's what that's who's in charge of that program. And it's almost always the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah, and it's so interesting that only the U.S. and New Zealand uh, are allowed to really do uh, B2C um, advertising for drugs. Other countries don't allow it. Um, there are sometimes they do like for things like Advil, but other there's no other medication that you might see in other countries that is advertised on TV that's not allowed. However, I would say they do have a lot of junk food about the advertisement, so you know, potato, potato. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, it's it, look, if you if you want to be free in this day and age, um, if and you enjoy uh, like watching TV, like I enjoy watching movies, right? I don't own a TV anymore. I may change that and own a TV. I mean, I have a projector. I just don't, you know, there's a lot of hassle. Mm. Um, I may get one again. I don't know because I like movies. But one thing I have not done in decades is watch commercials. I don't watch commercials. I don't watch the news. Um, I'm highly capable of figuring out what's going on in the world, you know, and doing a little research. And I always question anything coming from the mainstream media on either side of any argument, because it is heavily, there are, there are so many financial conflicts of interest. It's impossible to get a information with integrity um, unless you are willing to do your own homework. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. That's what we've seen throughout this whole process the last two and a half years. So why a lot of people also don't understand that, um, you know, medical practitioners don't necessarily have to be allopathic to be really good doctors because um, medicine is started as a homeopathic, or, or, I don't want to say homeopathic, but holistic mm-hmm. approach, which yeah. encompassed naturopathy and homeopathy. <laughs> and so when you have to be like, you have to be a medical doctor, which by the way, doesn't mean that you only know the body, you really know to push drugs they really can't conceive that principle Uh, but anyway we're derailing from the alkalinity yeah 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 for sure but i i really i I think that what you said about not watching the news is also one of the ways to stay alkaline because if there's anything more acidic (laughs) it's it's the news it's and and i'm glad you brought it back to that because let let me show some stuff and what we teach at the school let me just share this with your audience so if you're watching this on on video, you can see this. If not, you can go to energetichealthinstitute.org. You can download um, my free ebook, um, Art of Eating Healthy, and this chart is in there. All right, it's all free for you. Uh, what we do is we say, if we're getting out of the absolute model of zero to fourteen pH, let's get into a relativistic model. All right, of what happens when the food or the lifestyle comes into the body, right? As proven by 
the urine changes in urine fluctuation, urine pH fluctuation. That's how we do this. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in the middle of on this chart, we have net effect pH, uh, stress continuum, perspective, exercise, lifestyle, all the way down. So uh, to herbs and fruits and everything, because it's it's all of it. It's not just what you eat, it's what you do as well that determines whether you're alkaline or not. So for example, if um, let's just look at exercise. If you are being active five times a week, that's relatively very alkalizing for your body, as opposed to being sedentary and eating fast food and sugar and alcohol, that is very acidic. One of them is going to be supporting health and energy production. The other is going to be supporting disease. That's a d diet and lifestyle for disease. If you want to be diseased, go in that direction. You'll get there. Trust me. Um, when we look at um, sleep, for example, if you're getting eight hours uninterrupted, right? Uh, that's very alkalizing. If you're getting less than five hours total in a night, that's very um, acidifying. It's very hard on the body. There's a toll that's taken and it, and it shows up as additional acidity. So lifestyle plays a big role in this, but most people want to get into foods. They're like, okay, well, tell me about the foods. Tell me about the food. All right, well, let's look at the foods. All right. The first thing that we like to point out, Chantal, is that there's nothing more acidifying to the human body than eating GMO foods. Nothing more acidifying. This is these are Franken foods. The body doesn't know how to deal with them. There are so many studies showing a like an, uh, in pig models and up an increase of four hundred percent in the rate of gastritis and so forth. Right? I mean, it's just ridiculous. Gastritis is inflammation of the di of the stomach. And it's an indicative of the only time that the body will go into inflammatory state is when cells are being damaged. So when you, when you're, if somebody says, well, there's a lot of inflammation I'm dealing with, you know, one thing about that, then you know, that cells are being damaged. Mm -hmm. So if a person is eating GMO foods, you are damaging yourself. If a person is eating foods that are um, non-organic, that have pesticide residue all over them, you are damaging yourself. If People are eating meats that are from feedlots that where the animals were treated like crap and um, their tissue is completely infected. You are acidifying your body. All right. And if you really want to get down to it, if you are drinking the milk of another animal after you, and you, if you are, <laughs> if you are eating milk products, you are acidifying your, your, your body. Um, I like to tell in the school, the story of pus with animal <laughs> products that ev that you can have um, uh, 250,000 pus cells per drop of milk and still be considered uh, USDA uh, grade A milk. All right. Wow. So um, I don't know how many of you enjoy drinking and eating pus, but if you enjoy dairy, that's what you're doing. All right. Mm -hmm. So does that mean you should never have it? Because no cheese is so good. What it means is simply this, that it should not be a staple of your diet, that you should relegate those things to indulgences because you're eating for taste and not for health. And that's fine. Sometimes there's nothing wrong with that. But as a staple of your diet, it will ultimately make create a lot of disease and problems. Now, Another thing that is very acidifying when we're looking at this from a net effect pH standpoint are eating foods that we have delayed food allergy responses to. So a delayed food allergen is you ate a food on a Tuesday, but your immune system didn't start responding to it and start trying to get rid of that food until Thursday from your body, okay? And this is why it's hard for people to equate things like eczema and ear infections and, um, you know, and, and some of the maladies that we feel like the weird kind of little achy joint pains, you know what I'm talking about, Chantal, mm. like some of the things that go on with the body where you're just like, you I can't, can't explain it. Yeah. it could, it in most cases is a food you're eating that is a delayed food allergen that you haven't identified. So one of the things I do with all my patients as well is we get a blood draw on them and we find out which foods they're are, are personalized for their body, which foods their immune system likes and which foods their immune system doesn't like. Mm. And we eliminate the foods the immune system doesn't like. And then something happens. Yeah. People magically start feeling way better, you know, because of it. Dr. H, um, about the, 
the test for delayed food allergies, um, there is a little bit of controversy about it, like from gastroenterologists who think you can't really test and that there are a lot of, um, of labs which don't do it properly. So there are a lot of people that have made a lot of money from not doing it properly. How do you identify a good lab that knows what they're doing so that you get really the results that are accurate and people really do get better? It, you know, what I'll, what I'll say to that, Chantal, is number one, you're going to find controversy wherever anything that's being done threatens the gravy train of money coming into the pharmaceutical industry. That's where you're going to find controversy. So when you're looking at delayed food allergens, you have people saying, oh, that doesn't work, da 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 da, -da, -da. you know, that doesn't tell you anything. It's interesting to me how many people say that have never used delayed food allergy testing, have never done the proper elimination time frame, which is uh, at least a 28-day healing cycle, and act like they know something. You got to remember when you're talking about white coats, and I and I mean like you know these uh, these foot soldiers for the pharmaceutical industry, you know. When you're talking about them in the United States, they have on average 19.6 hours of nutritional education out of 6,000 hours of medical training that they receive. That amounts to a weekend workshop. Now, you, anyone with that low amount of subject matter expertise, you cannot consider them a subject matter expert. So they're really talking from an uninformed place. You know, when I got a doctor with 19.6 hours of nutrition trying to tell me nutrition doesn't work, I look at them and I can't help but think how bad of a doctor they are, how little integrity they have to admit that they don't know something. Like they have, their egos have blinded them to a simple reality that they don't know what they're talking about. And it's okay to not know. It's okay to tell a patient, well, I don't know about that. That's what integrity looks like. If somebody came to ask me about brain surgery, I'd be like, yeah, I took a class on that. I'm not qualified to discuss it. You know, I can't talk to you about this. I, I can tell you what the substantial Niagara is, but I can't tell you anything about how to get to it safely or anything like that. You know what I mean? I'm not qualified to do that. And I think that's true of nutrition for the white coats. They're not qualified to discuss it, but that never stops them from attempting to discredit it, right? So the first thing about delayed food allergies is you need to go with a reputable lab. The lab we use in the United States is Alatest. We've been using it for 20 years. And for this reason, they recalibrate their instrumentation several times a day. And the result of that, and I've talked with the lab directors, the result of that is we get very personalized, very accurate information. And we take it back to what we started this conversation with. It proves itself in the body. Mm -hmm. The body doesn't know how to lie. So when I work with a patient and we get that report in and we start revising their diet, when my holistic nutritionists start revising diets for patients, well, in, this, in their case, clients, what happens is we then watch. We watch to see if the inclusion of nutrients, if the shaping of their diet to their immune system's needs has a positive effect on what they came in for. And almost always it does. And so with that, there's your proof that it does work when it's done right. If we go to a different lab where they don't check their, in, or, you know, recalibrate their instrumentation several times a day, yeah, the results, the accuracy is going to drop and now things might not work. You know what I'm saying? So you have to always take things with the, what's the phrase, a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to take this stuff with a grain of salt. I've, I've done huge lectures in conferences about this because, you know, you get people arguing back and forth and you have all these practitioners who want to help, but they don't know who to trust. That's really the question today. Who do I trust? Yeah. What I tell folks is trust yourself. Trust yourself that you're an intelligent, compassionate human being and that you can figure out good from bad, right from wrong things that are effective from things that aren't. But you have to do your homework to that and you have to also be willing to do this, Chantel. You have to be willing to admit your own biases and you have to be willing to change your opinion in the presence of new information. Mm. 
Mm. That's what being objective really is. So we are in a constant state of knowledge gain, a constant state of evolution. I want to know what works. I want to know what's best so I can use that on not only me and my family, but every patient, every student that I work with. I want to know what the best is and what really, really works. And so that's what we do. We are in a constant, you know, relentless pursuit of that perfection, even though we understand that that perfection is unattainable. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and so now when I, when I get into a situation like this, I, I'll get test results for a delayed food allergy panel. You know, you talk with patients sometimes and, you know, you'll see like they're allergic to garlic and you're like, oh, dang, <laughs> you know, let's feel bad for you or avocados. You know, I had one patient so far who's allergic to avocados and I just felt so bad. I actually almost went out and shed a tear in the parking lot, you know, <laughs> after I just felt so bad for, her. you know, I was like, I couldn't imagine having to give up avocados, but what happens is like, I've had patients, Chantal, who um, uh, they were allergic to meats. They were allergic to every basic, every meat, beef and stuff like that. I'm allergic to beef too. And we, and so what her immune system said was she really, her, it wanted her to be vegan. We put her on a vegan diet, plant-based organic vegan diet. And uh, all of her symptoms went away. (laughs) You know, it was fantastic. Um, I've tested over, um, God, it's got to be over about three to 5,000 people now. It's got to be in that range. It's probably over 5,000 now uh, people in my career on delayed food allergies. And I've, we've seen a grand total of four people who had no discernible delayed food allergies. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, that, that just tells you how rampant this problem is. And it shows up, like you were alluding to earlier, as heartburn, right? Yeah you're just on the wrong diet for, for you. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have to leave this cookie cutter nonsense approach that one size will fit all for everyone. Instead, get into principles because there are principles that apply to everyone, like energy production, like we all have to breathe. Right. I mean, this is, these are basic principles, but then it starts getting into this wonderful world of personalization. And that's what a test like that really helps us do is get people into a personalized look. And if folks are interested and want to get this test done and they're in the United States, because we can only do it in the United States at this time, um, they can uh, go to energetichealthinstitute.org and we will facilitate that. And once you get the test, we don't just give you the results and say, good luck. We actually make sure you sit down with a qualified, certified, holistic nutritionist who will review your entire results and help you set up a plan moving forward um, so that you can feel confident that you can do this. It's not enough just to say, you got to take this stuff out. I mean, you also have to show people what they can eat and what can replace some of the things. So at any rate, it's, it's a beautiful test. It changed my life for the better. It's changed thousands of people's lives, probably in the hundreds of thousands, if you include all the practitioners around the, the, the country. Um, who use this lab, you know, it, it's, it's just a, it's a no brainer. You know what I'm saying? If you want to know, don't guess about your health. No, get a good test, get a good person who can interpret it and, and move forward with your health and your lifestyle and your dietary improvements with confidence, totally. right? That's what it's about. And uh, people that have um, delayed food allergies, can they recover from uh, this allergy and then build uh, their immune system so it doesn't react to these foods anymore eventually? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's very interesting. Um, first and foremost, just to bring everybody back to what we're looking at right here uh, on screen, if you're watching on the, on the video, if you're eating foods that you have allergic responses to, it's going to be varying degrees of acidifying to the body. So let's say a person, like we say over here, avocados, right, are are very alkalizing for Mm -hmm. for somebody. But let's say you were allergic to that avocado, right? You had a delayed food allergy to that avocado. That avocado that is over here for most people now is over here for you. Mm -hmm. So it's more acidifying. You see what I'm saying? Like that's that's why you have to know which foods your body and your immune system likes and which they don't. Okay. So, um, so reset your question again for me. I, I, I went on a little tangent right there. No, what, no, what it's, 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 great. it's in line with this. So if someone finds out that they're allergic to a very alkalizing food, so avocado, let's say with avocado, yeah. um, yeah. will they be able to then eat it again? Eventually, will they be able to not be allergic to them eventually? Can they cleanse the body enough, build the immune system so that they don't react to that food anymore? 
Clinically, it depends. All right. Mm -hmm. The immune system changes every about seven years. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I've felt, and I've seen in my clinical practice, people who were once allergic to something ultimately kind of outgrow that allergy as their body changes Mm -hmm. and they can have it again. Uh, Typically, if it's a low level reaction, we see that it's not, it usually is something that isn't long-term for them, but if it's a high level reaction, it's something that may be with them their entire life. Now that doesn't mean they can't have that food, Chantal. It just means they shouldn't have it as a staple of their diet. Mm -hmm. Once or twice a month, not a big deal. Really not a big deal once you've gone through a cleansing period and elimination period, really not a big deal. It's when you're eating that as a staple of your diet that the acidity, the net effect acidity becomes overwhelming for the system. And that's where we start to see cellular destruction and the pain syndromes that um, emerge as a result of it. Yeah. So uh, can we also clarify the difference between IgE and IgG? Because um, obviously mm-hmm. people that are allergic to something like realistically and that like peanuts, a child mm-hmm. cannot have peanuts, can't even breed peanuts and they would have an anaphylactic shock. Right. So how do we, um, you know, can we just clarify that? Because I don't want anybody to go out there and be like, oh, I don't like any peanuts then at some point. Well, in kids, my concern is that's a sign of, um, of a vaccine injury. <laughs> if you really want to start in some place that if a person at that young age is having that intense of a reaction, an IgE reaction, an immediate reaction um, to peanuts or shellfish, I always get concerned that that's indicative of some kind of uh, vaccine injury. All right. Cause I've, I've seen that in my practice. Mm-hmm. Um, so that means that that person should be detoxed. And then we kind of see, does their, um, reaction to, does their immune, immunological reaction, um, physiological reaction to that food change, mm. right? And, and if they want to, some people just like, like, I don't want to know. I'm just going to stay away from it. That's your freedom. That's your choice. I'm all for it. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's, that's my first concern. Um, when, we, when we look at this, we, we see situations where uh, people are able to overcome them. Like I, I had an intense allergy to shrimp. I was of course vaccinated as a child. I had an intense allergy to shrimp. If my grandmother was cleaning shrimp in the kitchen and I walked into the kitchen, my throat would start to close up. Oh, wow. And then by the time I was 13, I remember, so they, they would purposely, like everybody would make sure I stayed out of the kitchen when it would see food. So I was staying out of the kitchen a lot because my family is from Louisiana and everybody likes some, you know, crawfish gumbo. and shrimp and gumbo <laughs> and all that. Right. So, so get them out of here. No, no crawfish bisque and, and everything. Get it, get them out. You know? So um, I just remember one day when I was a teenager, I think it was like 13 or so walking in the kitchen accidentally, right? Cause I, you know, you, you, you're now I'm afraid that I'm going to die. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if I'm, uh, if I'm in the kitchen, I remember walking in accidentally and they were cleaning two big old piles of shrimp, you know, shelling them and deveining them and stuff like that. And I walked in and I was like, huh, my throat didn't close up. And so, you know, the body does change. And, um, I ultimately, it took me, I think a year or so to work up the courage to actually try shrimp. And my goodness, I love shrimp now. Um, so, you know, it, it, you know, you just, you, we have to appreciate that what we know about the human body and health is nothing compared to what there is to know. And if we bring that level of humility into our, um, into our, our life and our thought process, if we marry that, that humility with compassion, then we give ourselves the opportunity to create something very special, not just for ourselves, but for everyone that we are working with if we're a medical professional. Um, And I think that's really the the gift of holistic practicing and holistic thought, that that the body is designed to heal and that what we're doing is to work, we're striving to work with it to help it establish, reestablish the homeostasis that it's seeking. Um, and so that is a process that's done with love. It's done with compassion. It's done with humility. It's done with integrity. It's done with patience. And it's certainly done without force. Um, it's the allopathic white coat model, the pharmaceutical model that wants to force everything. I want to force the body to drop cholesterol. I want to force the body to, um, you know, to stop feeling bad or stop having heartburn. You know what I mean? And, and whenever you force the body to do something, 
there's always, I, I can say it like this, unintended consequences that may be intended when you really delve deeper into what they're doing and, and why. But at the very least, it's unintended consequences um, that, uh, you know, Chantel, I, I, first thing I do with patients, we look at their medications, they're on, if they're on medications, we've had patients with up to 32 medications at the same time that they were taking every day, 32 medications. We have no studies to talk about the potential toxicology for that. It's amazing that the patient was able to even to make it to my office, you know, when you're on that many medications, but what you start seeing when you set up the timeline of the introduction of those medications is that this medication was the first one. And then they needed this second medication for this other thing that cropped up. Well, when you look at the side effect profile for the first medication, it creates that next symptom. Mm. And then the next one creates the next symptom and the next one creates the next symptom. And it's like, well, what you're doing is you're taking these pills, these medications, these things we're calling medicine, you're taking them to deal with the problems created by the previous medication, mm. which tells us that we never did the most important thing that we can do in the practice of medicine, which is to seek the root cause, treat the root, yeah. right? Heal the root, heal the person. You know what I mean? And, and how do we get to that? With knowledge. You get to that with a basic understanding of what the cells need in, for energy production. And you make sure that the diet that you're recommending to the patient and the lifestyle you're recommending to the patient is personalized to their unique needs. And then what you've done is you've practiced the art of dossiere, which is to teach. You end up teaching them how to care for themselves so that we can be what we're supposed to be as doctors, obsolete in people's lives. We're not supposed to be in people's lives for their entire lives, like because we're treating the same thing, it never got better. Mm. We're supposed to, if we're gonna be in our patients' lives, it's because they remember us, because we help them with something that they learned from. And, you know, and what we have and share is this wonderful bond of healing between us um, because all we wanted for our patients was that which we would want for someone we love, which is the very best, yeah. you know, it's uh, it's, it's meant to be a beautiful experience for everyone, not a police driven fear-based bullied. If you don't do what I tell you, you suck. And I'm going to kick you out of my practice experience. It's meant to be a reassuring hug, you know, um, that there's someone out there that you haven't met yet that really loves you and cares about you and is going to do everything they can to help you. Like that's the world that we have the potential to create and exist within. That is, um, you know, I, I, but I'm going to just play a little bit of uh, support for the white coats. I'm not talking about the ones that make decisions, but I, I have met a lot of doctors who really don't know better. They really care for their patients. They really care to heal, but they just do not know better. And then when you talk about the alternatives, the problem is for them that now they have this huge debt that they have racked through medical school. Yeah. And of course, all by plan, all planned, you know, by the, by the system. And they can't leave their, their yes, they uh, can. practice. No, no, no. I, I'll challenge you there. Yes, they can leave. And where are they going? <laughs> Where, wherever they want to. Dr. Ben Marble is a perfect example of it. Dr. Ben Marble, free, uh, myfreedoctor.com. Mm. He was working at a hospital. They kept trying to inject him with the experimental COVID shots. Mm. And finally, when a nurse pulled out a, a, a needle, he finally said, you know what? This is my last day I'm ever going to be here. And he went out on his own and he created one of the greatest things that's happened in the last two years in terms of patient care. He created myfreedoctor.com and has successfully treated over 300,000 patients with COVID. So two choices from there forward. You have the choice to stand up and be the change that you want to see within that institution and bring it into the best version of itself, or you have the choice to leave it. Either of those are operating in full integrity and I will support them and I would not consider those people to be white coats, even if they wear a white coat. I would consider them to be good people, good doctors that are compassionate and care about their patients. The white coats for me are the people that are complicit and going along, being victims of this and making uh, in their own minds and in their own lives and believing that they have no power to affect change. They have no power to leave the situation. They have no power to honor their oath that we all took to do no harm. 
mm. and instead are going to accept the corruption as a part of life and instead are going to accept it to the point where they even benefit from it financially. I think it takes a very strong person to to do what you said. I personally think uh, and many people are not strong. And that's just the reality of our world, right? People like to be I actually heard yesterday a video why how to convince our family and friends of what we're saying. And this girl made a very good point in the video, and I'll send it to you offline. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, 70% of the population is comfortable to stay in the herd and are very afraid and so afraid that they would never even conceive stepping out and being isolated from the herd. And I think that's true because I've seen it, especially in the past three years, two years and a half. Um, and, you know, um, but this is why I wanted to make that comment and just be, you know, in, I hate that seeing, but like devil's advocate, um, because you know, we hear that. And the truth is like some good people that we just don't have the, the balls, as you said, right? Um, they just don't. And, and so in my opinion is, well, the ones that do, then that's where the change comes from, you know? Right, right. And I, I totally respect that. I mean, most of us don't want to fight, mm. right? And and just don't, it's just unpleasant. It's ugly. I fight all the time. It's unpleasant. I don't it's enjoy tiring. it. It's tiring. Well, let, me say, let me take that. I do enjoy it because I'm fighting for what's right. I'm fighting for kids and people. And believe me, I yeah. do, that That does do it for me. All mm. right. But what, I, what I'm suggesting here is that it's okay to, it, it it's okay to want to be a part of the the group and the herd because there's some kind of reassurance and safety in there. That's fo- that's totally fine, right? It's okay to not want to be bothered. Like, look, I just I got enough other things going on in my life. I don't want to fight. This is too big for me. I I, I get it. That's that's not what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. What what I'm what I'm suggesting here is that if that's your approach, don't you dare ask me for pity. Mm. If that's your approach and you're cl- playing a victimhood card on me, don't you dare ask me to go along with you on that. Mm. I'm okay with you not speaking out and being silent to a certain degree. I understand human nature and all that. I get it. Okay. What I'm not going to do, though, is make it all right or comfortable for you to do it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Because there are consequences for you doing this. We could have been done with this within a day. Had everybody said, no, I'm healthy. I am not going to be locked down. I'm not going to be afraid of getting sick. I've been sick before. I'll deal with it. We could have been over with this in a month had our public health authorities, what a ridiculous name for an agency, our authorities issued factual information about vitamin D and vitamin C and other nutrients. This would have been a non-issue. If they had just told the truth on death certificates, it's not even an emergency, mm-hmm. right? This is why we're fighting in federal court, the grand jury, mm-hmm. uh, with the grand jury petition. Your reasons for not standing up are your own. Mm-hmm. I'm not here to be anybody's judge. I'm not here to be a goalie. I'm here to serve God, all right? I do my best to be a loving, devoted servant of my creator every day, okay? What I will not do is I will not coddle that kind of victimized thought process. Mm. I will not make it okay. I will not support it in any way, shape, or form because it's a cancer on our culture and it prevents us from becoming the greatest expression of what we can be as humanity. And our enemies, the murder for profit people, feast upon it Mm. all the time. What's the underlying mentality that allows that? Cowardice. Mm -hmm. And how do we try to make that cowardice normal? By coddling victims. No. When a child falls down, okay, I'm going to go into a little quick different direction here. I see, because this is a perfect example of, I see first time moms doing it all the time. We love our children. Okay. My question to first-time moms is, do you love your children enough to let them fall down and get up on their own? Because when a little baby falls down, if you run over there and pick that baby up, you're creating dependence. You're creating a coward. 
But if you tell that baby to get up, and of course, I'm not talking about a severe injury. I'm talking about just they fell on their little bump, right? Mm -hmm. You let that kid get up. That kid now builds confidence in himself or herself that they can get up when they fall down. And trust me, there's going to be plenty of opportunities in life for them to fall down. Mm -hmm. When you celebrate them getting up, you let them know that this is the way. Mm. And that little act right there of a kid falling down and getting up on his own and then being celebrated for getting up on his own raises strong, resilient men and women in our world. Mm. And it's that little thing that determines whether, and, they, and you know, I, the reason I said first time moms is because usually you see moms figure this out by the time they get to a second or third kid. True. I'm, a, I'm seventh. So you can imagine how my family treated me. Oh, my family. <laughs> he's like, is he, oh, he came back home. Oh, set another plate at the table, Janice. Like that's, that's how my family was. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. So, so there's a certain, there's a certain glory in tough love. And it's something that we strongly need in our world right now, right? People, I hear this comment, Chantal, all the, way, all the time, and it's, it's beautiful to me. I really am appreciative of it. People are like, oh, thank you for being so courageous. Or, you know, you, your strength really have helped me, you know, give me strength. And I'm like, great, that's what it was supposed to be. I'm not here telling people that I'm the savior. I ain't no savior, mm -hmm. right? I'm here to fight, okay? And I'm here to tell people that there are ways to fight that are enjoyable, highly effective and don't put you at a risk for losing the things that you do need or the things that you do love and it comes down to having the willingness to do your research so you know what you're talking about and then speak that truth in a way that can be heard very seldom will you hear me just go off being angry i'm not saying i never do it but very seldom will you hear that and when you hear it it's unsettling for some people. That's fine. That's just what it is. What I am doing with all of my work over the last two and a half years and the work of the teams that I'm so honored to be with is I'm showing people that you have way more power than you think you have. Your power is given to you by God, by your creator, and it lives within every single cell of your body. If your cells are polluted, it gets in the way of that communication between you and your creator, where mm. courage really comes from. So like Jesus said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Mm. We have to make the flesh strong again. And then, and the way to do that is with nutrients, organic plant-based diets, net effect alkalizing the body, moving the body, right? That's what muscles do. They create confidence. That's why you got to, if you're sitting on your butt every day and you're getting flabby, you're not going to be very confident, mm -hmm. right? If we just do simple things, evil cannot promote itself. Doesn't mean evil will ever not exist. It means that it can't promote itself. And what we are in, in right now, in my opinion, is a world where evil has been promoting itself for decades and is now far overgrown and threatens all good people on this planet. I will not live my life a single day with the thought that when God asked me to stand up against that and for love, that I did nothing. I will not go before my creator and when asked, what did I do to protect his children, that I say to him, Father, I had a bill. I had a student loan that had to pay. I couldn't do this because I will not bring an excuse to my father. I will only bring the answer that, Father, I did everything I could possibly do. Yep. And I did it to celebrate the life that you gave me. So, so folks, yeah, Chantel, yeah, shut we me took up. It, we took it. <laughs> no, we took it around. Uh, fear, uh, very acidifying, and courage, very alkalizing. So if you want to live an alkaline That's it. That's it. Yeah, fear, fear, very acidifying, 
Courage, very alkalizing. What a beautiful synopsis right there. <laughs> and so let's go back to that chart, if you don't mind, to sure. talk I, about I, your I got favorite. a couple more minutes. Yeah, yeah. I got just a couple more minutes. Yeah. Let's talk about those, um, your favorite alkalizing food that people should uh, independently, like saying that they don't have any allergies to them, um, what they should have every day. So we talked about greens and mm -hmm. uh, any greens. And then what do you think the, the top others one they should, uh, they should um, add into their diets are? So let's preface it by saying whenever we mention a food, it's implied organic, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Organic. Food, herb, anything organic. Yeah. Right? Okay. I want no yeah. pesticides. And if you're like, well, doc, what about biodynamic? Yes. What about regenerative ag? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's organic 2.0 in my, in my world. Yeah. Okay. So when we look at foods, we first start with eating something green every day. That's the best way to get alkaline. So we go to the vegetables and the legumes in this section, and we look at the spinaches and the kales and the collard greens and Swiss chard and you know broccoli, especially for those wonderful sulforaphanes and everything that are so anti-carcinogenic. And then something that we have to consider very strongly, this is the gift of uh, Asian cuisine, <laughs> seaweed. Yeah, all of the seaweeds, right? I went into the store the other day to get some um, some wakame, and uh, uh, and they didn't have any. And I was just so sad. I was like, "Why don't you have any? You have all this nori. Where's the?" And they were like, "What is that?" And I was like, "Okay, we're gonna have to educate you so that you guys start ordering it and having it on the shelves because it's so great to add to your soups and to your broths and everything to give it even more minerals. It's 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 why that's it's why Japanese culture has such a low incidence of um, hypothyroidism because mm -hmm. they get so much wonderful iodine and additional phytonutrients from the sea, right? Yeah. And and of course, I can hear somebody thinking right now, but yes, there's all the plastics. Yes, there is. There's no perfect answer. Stop looking for it. Do the best you can with what you got. Okay. Mm -hmm. But stop trying to make the good, the enemy of the perfect. Please stop that. If that's in your thought process, listening to this. Okay. Do the best you can with what you got. That's mm -hmm. what we're doing here. Okay. Now there's other things like sweet potatoes, rich in vitamin <laughs> A and carotenes, right? Hey, doggy. And there's, <laughs> there's beets. Beets, fantastic for uh, trimethylglycine, which is essential for protecting your DNA. It's why people who drink beet juice look younger longer, right? They just, their skin stays really tight and everything because they are, it, beets help prevent DNA damage and the erosion at the cell level. Yes. Carrots, another thing. What a great staple for people, right? Mm. Carrots, carrot juice, right? Uh, for the beta carotene. Bell peppers for the lycopene. Pumpkins and pumpkin seeds for uh, the um, uh, for the zinc content and for the beta carotene as well. And what are these? These are all net effect alkalizing foods, right? And again, we said organic. You yeah. go into the grains and there's something like sorghum. Sorghum, the most nutrient-dense, antioxidant-rich grain in the entire grain family. It's why it made it even higher up than oats mm -hmm. and things like that right? Um, wheatgrass, look at that wonderful wheatgrass, you know, and chlorella and spirulina. Ooh, I love chlorella. Can you imagine a world without chlorella? Give me a break, right? It's a food. <laughs> yeah. You can actually live. Did you know that you can actually live on water and chlorella alone? I'm not surprised. Not surprised. You get chlorella, it would be miserable, right? Yeah. Uh, you, you know, you'd, <laughs> you'd be longing for some, some sweet in there, but you could actually exist on water and chlorella alone. Mm. Okay, that's how potent it is. It's, in my opinion, the most alkalizing food you can put into your body is chlorella. I've been taking it for 22 years. Uh, I will be taking it the rest of my life. All right, awesome. that's just how beautiful it is. Um, you know, we have sprouts, which are incredibly net effect alkalizing because of the enzyme content and the concentration of phytonutrients, especially broccoli sprouts, some of my mm. favorite. We have the medicinal mushrooms, same thing, the reishis, the maitakis, the chagas, right? Beautiful, beautiful things. If it comes from the earth and it's natural and it's organic, it is by and large good for us. Not always, but by and large good for us. We have the microalgae omega-3s, right? One of the things I really like, I really like this Sun Warrior brand right mm. here. Um, because in their capsules, not only is it microalgae concentrated omega-3 fatty acids, yeah, but um, right. but there's no yeah it's new. There's no carrageenan in the capsule. Mm -hmm. Carrageenan, as some of you may know, um, 
is in pro-inflammatory. And so it's really contraindicated for people with inflammatory bowel diseases, mm. right? Um, then we have things like, you know, avocado oil, which is a little alkalizing, not as much as the microalgae. But typically, if you're, it, what it comes down to is making sure the oils you use, you use them at the right temperature for cooking. Like if I see one more person cooking it, it, with <laughs> olive oil, I'm going to scream. I'm like, please, I know Italians love it, and I do too. I know Spaniards love it, and I do too. Please stop cooking with olive oil. If you do, make sure it's at a very, very, very low temperature that you use your olive oils on your salads, use your olive oils after you've plated or put a soup in a bowl, and then add your olive oil to it but cooking with it can only lead to trans fatty acids. If you see, if you're using oil and you see it smoking, it is now a trans fatty acid that is gonna make your, it's gonna harden your arteries and make for a lot of problems, okay? Mm. So so this is why I say it, it's an, it, olive oil has a very low flash point for when it converts into a, um, um, uh, a trans fatty okay. acid. That's why I'm saying, so that's, it's just, you got to stay. Now, as an indulgences and you're going out and eating, you know, they're using olive oil. Nobody cares. We're talking about where you have the most control, your kitchen. Yeah. And one of the things I advocate with my patients is to make sure they're eating at home at least five times a week. Yeah, absolutely. Okay? All right. At least five times a week. Okay. Um, last 2020 was the first year on record in the United States where people ate more meals um, out than they ate at home. 2020 right. before lockdowns. 20, 2020 during the lockdowns was the first year that Americans that uh, ate more than half of their meals from an outs that were more than half of their meals were prepared outside of their own home. So they were doing takeaway. Takeaway, the door dashes, the you know the deliver your own food because now you can get fast food delivered to your door. Oh you know now you don't even have to get up to drive through a drive through. You can actually just have them take, give it to you, bring it to your door, which is ridiculous. Oh God. I mean, you yeah. would have expected everybody to cook at home now they had more time. Well, that was, the, and, and to be fair, a lot of people did, mm. right? But the vast majority didn't. And yeah. like, remember we said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. <laughs> weak yeah. Every time you eat that diet for disease, you are weakening your flesh and you are impeding your spiritual resolve to have courage. Absolutely. You are making yourself ripe for fear because see, there's this in intimate relationship between our physical body and how our anatomy and our physiology and our biochemistry performs at the cellular level and our emotional state. Absolutely. A person with a healthy, clean, strong body does not see the world the same way as someone who's 50 pounds overweight or more with multiple pre existing conditions who sits on their butt all day. Yeah. And that's why I say I will not coddle that person, but what I will do for that person, Chantel, who's sitting on their butt every day and putting on weight is the minute, the split second that they say I want to change this, I'll be there to help them mm -hmm. and I'll celebrate them all the way through. Remember that example of when a, some when a kid falls down, you got to let yeah. them pick themselves up. But what yeah. do we have to do to make sure that when they pick themselves up it's great? We have to celebrate. You will see me when I see somebody that's overweight, like jogging down the street, you will actually see me stop my vehicle and celebrate and give them a high five for what they're doing and let them know that somebody else out there sees what they're doing, knows how hard it is and is celebrating them because what they're doing is freaking awesome. Perfect. Right. And yeah. that's the attitude we have to take with the people around us. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I have a question about ginger. Ginger is very good, but it's a little bit acidifying. Does that right. mean people have to avoid it? Or does that mean you can in no. implement it and complement your alkaline diet with that? Well, this is what's nice about the way we teach it at the Energetic Health Institute. It's not one thing. One thing doesn't have the power to overcome all things. Mm. So it's what do you have it in conjunction with? Maybe you have ginger used in conjunction with burdock root and licorice root, and there's some nettles and some, uh, some cinnamon in it and things like that. Now what you have is something, the net effect of all the combination of those is still alkalizing, mm. right? So that's, it doesn't mean you, it, we, we got to get out of this idea that we shouldn't have anything that's acidifying. No, you need acid. Your body needs acid. It just doesn't need acid to dominate your dietary experience. 
Okay. That's when it turns into disease. All right. Yeah. But you do need acid, ascorbic acid, vitamin C, amino acids, right? Proteins, yeah. right? Uh, fatty acids, right? We need acid. It's just we need to make sure we're balancing it with alkalinity as well. Yeah, absolutely. Perfectly said. Thank you for that. So people can't com be confused about it. Now, I know we don't have a lot of time to think to talk into the next question, but very, very short answer to this. Okay. Uh, intermittent fasting. She has to tell me that audience because I will over talk <laughs> like nobody's business. But no, I can keep you again. here and they probably <laughs> will have to just endure a long <laughs> episode. But um, I know you have you're busy. So I just want to make sure that you can give us a question. I know, I know. I'm, I'm teasing. Now, I'm that's teasing. cool. Um, between the two of us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but uh, but yeah, intermittent fasting. So uh, there was um, an episode of um, the Delicious Liela podcast last, two weeks ago, last week, um, talking about intermittent fasting and looking at the science behind it. And right. uh, although the research shows that fasting can be very beneficial, it wasn't really um, strong enough to say, yes, it is totally, it's not a myth. So they were doing this myth science, uh, myth of fact. And um, I, I think they missed out a lot of points out of that conversation. Um, but I understand what they're saying, but I think it was missing out a lot of points. One fact is we all do intermittent fasting when we sleep in any case. And it's just about then, okay, are you consciously actually stopping to eat at a certain time so that you have enough time that you're not eating? Right. And then when you wake up in the morning, you don't straight go into your fridge and you kind of take a little bit of time for the digestion to get started. You move your body. So what is it about intermittent fasting that is so beneficial for people? And how can it be implemented without becoming a problem or an obsession for people? Maybe that's a better question when we talk about intermittent fasting. Sure. Well, I've been practicing intermittent fasting for at least four, maybe five years, maybe even more than that now. Uh, I do 16 hours at least um, in between um, eating windows every day. Um, and I think there's a I think there's a couple of key things here. Let's let's see if we can simplify this in the little bit of time that we have remaining. First and foremost, you know that um, the, the whole entire point of fasting, is to engage a process at the cell level called autophagocytosis, which really literally means self-eating, that the cell is eating away the things that shouldn't be there. So if there's if there's infections, the cell will now wipe it out and then um, start getting rid of those things, right? And so it's really, uh, I, I prefer to look at it in terms of self-healing, that the cells are, are self-healing, right? So it's very important for us to make sure we have periods that we don't eat. But how would somebody know that autophagocytosis is actually going, is taking place at the cell level? Well, there's actually a sensation that we are given through our nervous system, let us know that autophagocytosis is underway, and that is hunger. So when you're feeling hungry, you know autophagocytosis is taking place. Now, I also practice um, three, five, seven day clinical fasting you know, um, several times during the year, usually I do a three, five or seven day fast, um, you know, usually about five, six times a year, you know? Um, and what we want folks to understand about autophagocytosis is that it's a process at the cell level that ramps up. Mm. Okay. So are you entering into autophagocytosis when you get hungry? Yes. But is it as is it reaching its peak levels? No, not through intermittent fasting. It doesn't reach its peak levels from what we know today until about hour fifty four of no calories. Okay, so you are you getting some inter, are you getting some autophagocytosis when you practice intermittent fasting? Yes. Are you getting peak levels? No. So both of those statements can be true. It doesn't mean that nothing's happening, but it also doesn't mean that everything is happening. Right. So, so what happens is you have to look at this as an accumulated accumulation process. If you, let's say you ate some food, um, out of phagocytosis, hunger doesn't really kick in until, um, eight hours later. Right. And then you go another eight hours before you eat. That's technically about eight hours of auto phagocytosis, right? Which is cool, but it's not peak, but it's still pretty cool. That adds up day in and day out. So over the course of a week, if you got eight hours of autophagocytosis in every day, over the course of a week, that's 56 hours of autophagocytosis. None of it was peak, but still it's better than nothing. What 
intermittent fasting does that I really get excited about from a doctor perspective is it gives people an understanding of the control they have over their diet. It puts them into number one, an eating window where you're saying, look, I'm only going to eat for eight hours every day max, right? And that gives us time for really one eight major meal and, and a snack. So it introduces the idea of calorie responsibility for folks. Yeah, we discussed I think, that last week. Right. And that calorie responsibility is what promotes longevity and quality of life. Mm. We've seen this in Reese's uh, monkey and animal studies repeatedly. So it, it really supports longevity and, and good longevity. You're not just around to be around, you're around and you still feel good in your body, you're still healthy. Um, when you couple that with a nutrient dense diet, supplementation and organic plant-based eating approach, eating lifestyle, now you're putting yourself in the best known position we have today to, in my opinion, to promote your own health and the health of your family. Mm. So intermittent fasting is a, a great, great tool. Um, but if somebody wanted to say there's no autophagocytosis happening, that's clearly wrong. And if somebody wanted to say that it allows you to get into peak autophagocytosis, that's clearly wrong. So what you have to do is do your research and be a little discerning, like we have been saying, trust your body and what it's saying and what and how you feel. And one of the things that I like to do, Chantal, is I like to make sure I work out before I eat. So when I get close to the end of my window, I like to make sure I've gotten a workout in there mm -hmm. um, so that I really burned all the calories from the day before. I make sure I'm really hungry and I've earned my next meal. And it's a good lifestyle, I think, to lead. And I feel really good doing it. <laughs> I, you know, I'd like to believe I don't look like I'm just about 50, but uh, I am. I'm, uh, I'm a year away from being 5-0. So I think I'm doing pretty good this point. And I think, uh, like I, we've said to begin, the body proves itself. If you're doing things that are working, it'll prove it. And if you're doing things that aren't, you'll feel it. You'll feel it. Yeah. And how important is to eat an alkalizing, a uh, good uh, organic diet in those eight hours? Um, it is the most important thing you can do if you really love yourself and you love your family and you want to be able to spend as much time with them as you can, good quality time is to make sure that you um, invest in organic plant-based foods as the foundation of your diet. It gives you actually a little bit of extra room, Chantal, to, um, to indulge you know, from time to time without consequence. And I think that's a good balance for all of us because let's not kid ourselves. We're all going to indulge and we all should. Life is meant to be enjoyed. Mm. It's just not to be um, a glutton and it's not meant to be hedonistic in our approach. Okay. Yeah. Too much of a good thing is not a good thing. Absolutely. Okay. I know you have to go. So All I right. want to thank you for the tough love. Thank you for the <laughs> wonderful information. <laughs> thank you for sharing openly. Um, you know, I, I, I actually, I knew that you would probably go off on that, on that one, but I, um, I like that you did because I like to have conversations where we look at all ang angles and yeah. your points were very, very valid. And I agree with you. Um, you know, it's not about support. It's not about condoning victimhood. And I think it brings up to the surface, the point, the problem that in society now we are almost, we have to be politically correct. Otherwise we're not supportive. You're not respective. And I think we have to always stand up with what's right and what's wrong. So I think you did, um, you know, what you said makes a lot of sense and I agree with it. Um, I, I do also understand the other party. I do, mm -hmm. uh, but I always come down to the fact that either you have courage or you're not. So even either, either you're alkaline or you're <laughs> so acidic, right. Right. point right. blank. So thank you so much for that. And uh, yeah, I, I we have to have you back to have more conversations about um, health for sure. So I really look forward to that. Me, me too. Anytime you want me, just let me know. I'm, uh, you know, getting me to shut up. That's the trick most of the time. So <laughs> thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. H. See you soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. H. And thank you everyone for staying on for this episode. I hope that between part one and part two, you really collected a lot of golden nuggets that you can use and implement in your daily life to make better dietary choices for your body and for your health. So if you like this episode, please do make sure that you like, share and comment and review so that we can keep on growing for you to help you. So I'll see you next time. Bye bye.